And welcome back to another special edition here of the Big Man's Report Live. I am your host, Blake Roselle. I hope you all have been well. And wow, man, holidays already. We're in the holiday season. So I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you may celebrate out there. Um, I want to wish you a warm and wonderful, cheerful holiday season from uh, myself and everyone at the Big Man's Report Live podcast. Um, we wish you season's greetings, and we hope you enjoy the holiday and the new year as well. Um, so thank you again for joining me. Uh, before I introduce my special, special guest tonight, I can't wait to introduce him. Before I get to that, um, I just want to say my last interview um, with actress Genevieve Rossi from, uh, you may know her from the Gravesend series and a couple other horror films. Uh, she was on my program a few weeks back. Um, after th after Thanksgiving, and uh, we have some footage of that up on my YouTube channel. Uh, and the interview actually is will be posted on there if it is not already, um, so you can catch that there. And also, you know, check out my Instagram page at the Big Man's Report Live underscore, and you can find all my information on there, my videos, my content, and you know, my up and new YouTube channel. Like all, like I said before, is always all my content's on there, so you can't miss a show um, if you can't watch a show live. So. Thank you all again for jo joining us tonight. Um, I would like to now introduce my my special guest I'm having on, and I'm glad we you know, had the chance to get him on here tonight, and we you know we, glad we worked it out. Um, but I would like to introduce you may know him from the famous The Bronx Tale. How could you forget him? Main leading character, and also in Sopranos and a lot of other very um, big time films over the years. Uh, this gentleman's a great actor, um, and more importantly. He's, he's a great person with a great story, um, you know, of how he became about and, and you know, all the things in his lifetime uh, and what he's doing now today. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my main man, Mr. Lilo Brancato. Lilo, how are you, my friend? I'm well, Blake. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on. I'm looking forward to this. Um, so what I always do, I like to start off um, a little bit about yourself so my audience gets to know um, you know, where did you grow up, Lilo? You know, what, before we get into the acting and all that stuff, where did you grow up? What was family life like at a young age? You know, take us from the top. Well, I was born in Bogota, Colombia. I was adopted when I was four months old by Italians in Yonkers, New York. So I, you know, four months, I, I, I went to Yonkers when I was a little baby. Uh, so I don't really know anything else but, but Yonkers. That's where I grew up. I still live here now. Um, my dad was Sicilian. My mom's Calabrese. And I grew up in a middle class family. Um, we, we, you know, we, we always had enough. Uh, you know, we grew up, it was a great childhood that we had. A lot of kids on our block. So I would say a lot of positivity came out of that. So, yeah. So you, so obviously you're adopted and you, so you grew up in that New York lifestyle, very close knit family. Um, so, I mean, tell, I mean, that, that had to mean, you know, especially coming from the Italian and, you know, on my side, my father's Italian. So I have a little bit of that. I know what the family, all the family's all about, but. What was it like growing up in New York in the neighborhood as a young, as a young boy? And from what you can remember up until now. You know, I mean, it was very exciting. Yonkers, New York, you know, was very exciting. We had a great street, a lot of kids. And I just look at it now, and I think these kids today, they're being cheated out of their childhoods because they're all on their phones or they're inside and doing all this other tech stuff. But they're really missing out on what it's like to be a kid you know what i mean and being outside you don't see that anymore right but uh yeah like i said we had a great childhood um and yonkers i had a lot of my relatives live there you know my uncle joe was down the street and then my other joe uncle joe was up the, you know up the street so everybody was really close by right so that was really nice because we were able to spend all the holidays together like christmas eve would be on my dad's side and then christmas day would be on my mom's side so we did a lot you know a lot of that right so yeah, so you had you you definitely had that experience with with the family um, orient orient you know notation, and also you did everyone on the block as as a young kid you know you you and like you said you made a great point about how you feel like the the kids nowadays and I even remember when I when I was younger I mean we had kids all over the street and, uh, and you know down, I live, live in South Jersey but you had kids that were outside they were playing and stuff like that but nowadays it seems like with technology and everything that's it's come about in the last five six years I mean. And especially since the pandemic, you know, I think these 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 kids really are driven towards that kind of thing where, you know, they, they don't know what it's like to go out and play football in 15 degree weather with your buddies. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. some kids do, but it's not as much as it used to be. You're absolutely right. Playing tackle football on the grass when the ground is frozen. 
Yeah. <laughs> she might as well be playing on the concrete, you know, but yeah, we had, you know, that was all, that was all great, you know, and a lot of, a lot of why I am the way I am and my personality and have been given the ability to act in such films. I attribute a lot of that to growing up in Yonkers right. because Yonkers just has a lot of like lively characters and a lot of great people that I met over the years who have made a really, really big impression on me right. and, you know, have, have added to my arsenal as, you know, weapons that I have as an actor in which, you know, in the craft. So it was really great growing up in a place that was really rich like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great point. You know, a lot of those things you took with you as you got older and it helped you into your career. And, um, and, you know, the best learning tool I think is experience, right? You could, you could say, you know, watching, listening, being around, you know, that, that, that's even the best learning tool, you know, reading from a textbook and all that stuff. I mean, you could, you could learn that way too. And everybody has a different way of learning, but I think the actual feel of it is, is what you see and what you hear, you know what I mean? And you, like you said, you contribute that to your, to your personality and to your arsenal. It's a great point. Well, not only, yeah, not only what, not only to what you see or what you hear, but the experience plays a big part because of what you hear and what you see, but then the experience shows you how these things play out. Right. So if I'm going to do this and this, I saw the last three times from my own experience, this is how it plays out. So maybe this time I'm going to do this. A lot of times the book knowledge doesn't teach you how things are going to play out. Mm -hmm. They just teach you what it is, how to do it. But what's the repercussions? What's the consequences? And a lot of that you can only learn through real life experience, you know? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. What, in other words, what are the outcomes of these things and how do we, how do we go about these things? Not just hearing and listening. It's all, it's a great point. Um, right. Absolutely. So, so you're growing up in Yonkers, New York, um, you know, as a young, as a young kid. And, you know, again, I mean, as you grow up, you, you, how you see, I'm sure you see these great actors and these great things coming from New York, but not even in New York, but New York's a hot, a hot, a hot spot, right? Let's just say, especially back in those days, I mean, I, you know, you know, for a long stretch, New York was, was is the big spot for movies and fashion and all that stuff. You know, you look at California, the same, you know, just Hollywood and all that. But some about New York City, man. I mean, even what I think personally, and, and I don't live too far away from it, but there's a there's a there's a certain feel about New York that if you if you especially if you live in New York. Now, I can't speak on behalf of that, but I can see the way people who live in New York are, and they they have a certain way that they just they just get it you know what i'm saying like they just they just go they, they go about things a certain way and you know what i'm trying to say like it's just i think it's a it's a good um it, it's, it's a it's a good way to kind of live to live and kind of be you, you, like you said taking back to the experience thing i mean growing up in new york i mean um lead, you lead to these actors and these actresses and all that stuff you see things you see fashion what can, what can you say on behalf of that um you know i gotta say though philly philadelphia Absolutely, yeah. A lot of my experience in being there, that's a great little city as well. Yeah. Some really great characters that uh -huh. I've met from there, some really great people. And I see, I mean, Philly's a little bit smaller than New York. Yeah. But it's definitely, I mean, a little different on the accent. You guys say on, I'm on the phone. We say <laughs> on the phone or on the phone. Yeah. But the accent's a little bit different. But Philly people are very, uh, you know, they're, they're very much like New Yorkers. I got yeah. that feel. Like when I go there, when yeah. I've been to Philly, Philly's another great city. The food is great. The people are great. Uh -huh. There's plenty to see. I like how the neighborhoods are intimate and everyone, you know, I like that kind of yeah. stuff. That makes me feel, you know, you go to other places, well, you go to places like L.A., you could live, you know, you could have a neighbor for 20 years. You barely know who he is. Right. You know what I mean? But 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 in New York and Philly places like that it's 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 the opposite you know yeah and, uh, and absolutely too like i mean when i was saying new york i mean new york's obviously like the set like philly and particularly south philly where my my father's family's from and you know a lot about the city as well again it has that same kind of feel and philly and new york go hand in hand you know people are out you know on the streets and and they're saying hello to one another you know like you know they're uh, cooking on sundays and stuff like that i mean it's a very Close knit, everybody's real tight, and like you said, New York has a lot of similarities. But then I, but my point is, growing up and all that too, like we we were saying, you know, I, I think that teaches you. We a couple of points we made teaches you a lot about life, and especially for your instance, like getting into the acting world. Um, I mean, before we get into your career, 
I mean, did you have some big inspirational people in your lifetime that you saw like actors maybe or icons that you followed at, at a young age? Well, I always liked Robert De Niro. I mean, yeah. when I was younger, someone told me I was working at a florist. Hey, did you anyone ever tell you you look like Robert De Niro? I didn't really know who he was. Um, so then once I heard that, I went home and I asked my parents, like, who's Robert De Niro? And then they were like, you know, my father was, oh, he's a guy I play. My father was like, he plays all, all different parts and he's a great actor. And, and then I saw Raging Bull and I started watching these movies and I saw the resemblance. And because of the resemblance, I wanted to be like him way more than if we didn't resemble each other. Right. So De Niro was a big reason, but I never wanted to be an actor. Right. I wanted to, you know, like I followed De Niro's career. I used to do great impersonations and I loved his films. But as far as an actor, I just think because of the long shot of it, I never really put much thought into it. Like, this is what I want to be. Yeah. Because I didn't really want to get excited for no reason because this is like, this is like a one in a million, you know? Yeah. But then that film, then a Bronx Tale, you know, it just happened to present itself because that was an open call audition wow, in 1992. Okay. I heard about the film. And I heard of all these kids that were going to read and that De Niro was making his directorial debut and he wants real people from, you know, from the street and like unknown, like not actors. He didn't want actors, no professional actors. So, you know, I always knew that people told me I looked like him, but I still thought it was a long shot until July 5th, 1992. They found me on the beach. The guy's name was Marco Greco. They had me come in to read that night at the Belmont Playhouse. And that's when I discovered I'm, I'm a pretty good actor. He gave me the scene when I was shaving, but in the original script, De Niro was shaving. And then I approach him or he approaches me and says, you know, and I says, hey, you know, what do you think about me going out with a color girl? So that was the audition scene. Right. Yeah. And when I saw it in screenplay format, I said, wow, I think I can do this. This seems pretty doable. It looked pretty easy. So I learned the lines. I did the scene. The guy was blown away. He loved it. So he said, can you do another scene? And so I was doing other things. And then I actually spoke in Sicilian because I speak that dialect well. Right. And the wow. the, the character, Calogero, yeah. that's a very popular Sicilian name. And so is Lillo, Lillo, Calogero, Salvatore. You know, yeah. These are Sicilian names, you know? Oh, Rosario. Rosario, Salvatore, Lillo, Calogero. These are all... Rosario, they call him Sarido. Salvatore, they call him Toto. You know, Lilo, you know, it's, these are all very Sicilian names. Sure, sure. So when I heard that, I'm like, wow, because no one really knows that name. That's not yeah. even Italian. That's like Sicilian. Right. It's not, you know, Italians know the name, but then you don't really hear Italians. Yeah. So I said to myself, wow, this role is perfect for me. So I gave them my tape. They liked it. They called me in a few days. I went down to New York City. They invited me down to New York City where De Niro's office was. Wow. So when I get there, there's all these actors and they kept calling me back and calling me back, calling me back. There was less kids there every day. And it was just me. So then one day they said, Bob wants to meet you. And I didn't know that was Robert De Niro. So I go in the room. I see it's De Niro. He told me, I really like what you're doing. Just keep it up. Don't do anything different. And I think they were strongly considering me for the role then because they started, they started pairing me up with different actors mm -hmm. to find the right recipe for my friends, for the girl. So I said, wow, there must be some strong consideration if they're doing all of this. Right. So I kind of thought I had the part until we went for the screen test. And then these are all the finalists. I was dressed up. De Niro told me to dress up. They're going to put me on film. But then the kid who shot Sonny at the end of the movie, he was there. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he told me, he said, I'm reading for your part. And I was like, really? I thought, you know, in my mind, I thought I had the part. Yeah. But I knew he was older and I knew that he got there for a reason. There's, there's, you know, he didn't get that far if he wasn't good. So he had something that they liked. Yeah. So I knew at that point, it doesn't matter that I look like Robert De Niro. They have this kid here for, for a reason. Maybe he's a better actor because he's older. Because, you know, a kid doesn't have to look like his father. A kid doesn't have to look like either parent. Sometimes yeah. they don't. Sometimes they resemble the mother a little bit more. Sometimes they resemble the father. I happen to resemble De Niro. So it worked and it looked right. You know, it looked right on film. So we all did our parts. Uh, and then, you know, I didn't hear from anybody all weekend. And then they called me and said, Bob would like to see you. I went in and he told me I got the part. I was so, so excited. And then to be working with him every day. And finally we shot the movie. And I, I just learned so much, you know. And then after that, I got an agent. And then I went off and did Renaissance Man, Crimson Tide, Sopranos. Yeah. And, you know, I did a lot. But I could have done a lot more. I just didn't take it as serious as I should have. 
not even that I didn't take it serious, but I kind of took it for granted because it came so easy. I thought it would always be like that, but that's not the nature of the business. See what I'm saying? I didn't have the experience. I didn't know how not being that hungry with an, with with an opportunity like this, what it was going to result in because I didn't have the experience, but now I do. Right. But now I know if, if I get something, I'm able to parlay it into something else. I would do that. I would know time is of the essence and you have to strike the iron when it's hot. Yes. And uh, I didn't do that. I didn't have the experience. So, but listen, you know, I think everyone makes mistakes in their lives and everyone learns from their mistakes and hopefully try to do better the next time around in a similar situation, which is what I try to do every day. But uh, yeah, like I said, I went off and did all these films and you know television and stuff. And you know, with that lifestyle comes the drugs and the fast life and the alcohol. Oh. So then I started dabbling in that, you know, early on when I was like 17, 18. And throughout my 20s, I just got worse and worse, you know, got worse and worse to the point. And in 2000, I jumped out of a car doing 60 miles an hour. Oh, geez. I was all high on, you know, cocaine and stuff. And I was experiencing psychosis, right. which is something that I'm writing right now, a film, something about, well, that's a little part of it, but it's it's all real. It's all real life experience. So I jumped out of the car. I was already addicted to cocaine, but once I jumped out of the car and I was in the hospital, I had staph infection. It got really bad. That's when I was introduced to the narcotic pain medication. Right. So I didn't realize that this stuff was like heroin just because the doctor prescribed it. So I'm saying, why would the doctor prescribe me something that's lethal like that, that people are dying from every day? Right. So, you know, my personality, if one doesn't work, I don't take two. I go right to three. So that's what I did. And when I take the three, hmm, I felt really good. Like, wow, this is really good. This is from these things. So I remember I would just smoke cigarettes and be all high. And I just loved it. And I was doing more and more and more. Um, Got to the point where I got very addicted to you know the narcotic pain medication, it wasn't around and able to get as easy as as before. So that's when I was introduced to the heroin. <clears throat> uh, I was introduced to the heroin. Started liking that, and then in around 2003, I met a girl, Stephanie. Started going out with her. My drug addiction spiraled out of control. I lived with her, and I was able to do it whenever I wanted. But then she was. She was, you know, taking her life serious, seriously, going to school, going to trying to go to medical school. And, you know, then we broke up and I was really sad about that. So I started doing more drugs, became friends with her father just as a reason to go buy the house. And that was going on for a while. Then on December 10th, 2005, we went out one night and uh, in search of drugs, I broke a window. Someone who was next door heard the uh, heard the broken glass came out to investigate. We were not burglarizing the home. That's that's a that's a crock of shit. I know they want to sell that to try to say it's a felony murder, but it wasn't, right. okay? There was all kind of evidence. Like even neighbors heard me screaming, Kenny, Kenny, this is after I got shot, okay? After uh-huh. you got shot and you're about to die, you're going to call for someone who's going to legitimately help you, right? right? Right, you're not going to, your subconscious is going to call the first place where you think you can get help. Yeah. And I called Kenny. I didn't call my friend who was with me. I didn't call for the police. I didn't call for mom. I called for Kenny, which means that him and I were friends. And which means I felt like I had license or privilege to be in the house, which right. doesn't make it a felony murder. And that's why I was acquitted of that. But, you know, at the same time, I'm not, I don't want to minimize anything. A young, brave police officer lost his life, you know, and that's that'll never go away. And that's something that I think of every single day of my life. Although a lot of people don't think I do. They think I'm just like some Charles Manson monster because of the way I was written up in the in the press. But that's not the case. I really do. You know, I do love mankind. I'm, I'm a loving person. I had never been in trouble before that. And that, that was, you know, that was that was what it was. I loved that girl. I was hanging out with her father and all of that happened. But if it didn't happen, I wouldn't be here right now. It saved my life. So I like to look at it as that you know, her old police officer as being the angel in my life that gave up his own for me to do what I'm doing now and trying to help other people not go down the road that I went down. And I take that very seriously because I recognize that is what my true purpose in this world is. And that's why Bronx Tale happened. And that's why all those other things happened. And that was to increase my level of influence. So now when I do have this important stuff to say, 
people would be more willing to listen to me because I was C from a Bronx tale as opposed to someone who wasn't C from a Bronx tale. So right. whatever it is, it works. I, I make it work for me. And if it, if I have that to use in a positive way, then I'm going to use it. If I can help other people through that, then that's what I'm going to do. You know? So I got shot. He got shot. You know, the, you know, obviously the other guy lost his life, rest in peace. So we both got locked up. He was charged with murder in the first degree. I was charged with murder in the second degree. We spent three long years in Rikers Island. Uh, at the end of 2008, we both went to trial separately. He went first. He got convicted of murder in the first degree. Felony murder, not intentional murder. Because he didn't chew first and they couldn't prove it, even though the newspapers say that. But they don't realize he wasn't convicted of intentional murder. He was convicted of felony murder which means in the commission of a crime or, you know, in furtherance or an immediate flight therefrom. Right. And then I went to trial about two, three weeks later. And after a month long, I was acquitted of murder, burglary, but I did get convicted of attempted burglary. So I was sentenced to 10 years. I had three that I already served. Then I went upstate and, you know, I thought it would be a wise decision to get my GED right off the bat, which I did. And then I figured I'm going to be here for another, you know, substantial amount of time, at least another four and a half years. So I may as well go to college. So what I did was I enrolled in a male correspondence school that was, uh, you know, uh, an accredited school. And it was a degree program, not a certificate. So it was actually real. You pay extra money for it, but I didn't care. And, you know, it kind of offset the fact that I was incarcerated and, you know, you know, keeping me and and, 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 it, and and it prevented me from keeping myself in that victim mode. Like, oh, I didn't do anything. I never really thought like that. But sometimes it's hard not to. Right. But the best thing that ever happened, because I always took full responsibility for how my actions and my drug addiction definitely made a contribution in the in the in the heroic police officer's death. And like I said, I'm I'm very sorry to, to you know to whoever I hurt with 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 that happening. But you know, um, I'm just glad that, you know, God was, you know, willing to give me a second chance. And like I said, I take it very seriously. And I realized that someone did lose their life and that was someone else's son and someone else's brother. And, uh, you know, and I got to take this seriously. But after being there, you know, prison, um, I got an I earned an associate's degree in business management. And it's really helped me immensely since I've come out. It's it's taught me to te uh, talk better. And to just be able to articulate myself because I knew a lot of people would want to hear my story because they heard one side of it in the press and the newspapers. Yeah. And I knew they would want to hear my side as well and then determine for themselves what they think really happened that night. Yeah. So I definitely thought it was in my benefit to do so. So then I came home. Things were really tough for me initially. I mean, it's not like I was a war hero and came home, you know, people would, hey, would open arms. Hey, brother. You know, a lot of people hated me. Um, a lot of people hated me and, but you know what? I never let that get to me. I just knew it went with the territory, you know, and I kept reminding myself, someone did lose their life and you're lucky that you still have yours, meaning I still have mine. Right. And that's what kept me going because some days I'm like, you know, this is like so tough, but it just kept me going and get me going. And the more that I kept going, it just kept, it built more character and just made me stronger and more resilient. Because I knew the plan was to 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 help others not go down this road. And if and if I go down that road again, there's no way I can help them not go down that road. So it gives me that extra layer of strength. And uh, you know, now I I um you know I, I'm at a rehab, I work at a rehab, I'm director of public relations at More Life Recovery. You got my friend Steve, Joe, Kenny, these are my bosses, great guys, Dory, Dana, everyone over there, really, really good people. A lot of them are in recovery as well. So we all know and understand each other very well. We're, we're like a team. We all have the same goal. And that's to help others not do what we did. And, you know, it's a great place for me to be because it keeps me plugged in. You know, I don't necessarily like NA meetings or AA meetings. It's just me. If it works for you or, you know, whoever, then by all means do it. It's right. just not something that works for me. But where I am here, this place, that definitely works for me. Because you got a lot of these kids in there, you know, late teens and 20s. And these kids, like, you know, they look up to me. Yeah. They look up to me. They see me. They see, like, wow, this guy is actually sober. And he's actually built a good life for himself after recovery, like, and after drug addiction. Yeah. And when they see that in the flesh, 
it inspires them because now they know it can actually happen. Because when you're in the grips of that addiction, you don't think that can actually happen. The grips of the addiction rob all of that hope and that ambition and everything else that goes with it right from you to keep you stuck where it wants you to be. And that's in a place where eventually it's going to kill you. That's the goal of addiction, to kill you. The, the, the goal of drug addiction and alcohol addiction is to kill you. And in the meantime, twist your mind, smash your dreams and everything else. And uh, it's a really, really ugly thing. And I realized that. And, you know, unfortunately, not everyone understands it. See, I, 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 addicts were born with, you know, without uh, dopamine brain receptors, which means that we got to go look for, you know, we can't achieve pleasure on our own just because our brains don't function normally. So that means we have to go search for it some outside source, whether it's gambling, drugs, alcohol, sex, shopping. You know, it, like a, a, people have to understand, like addicts are not just, you know, a weaker person than you who just can't say no. It has, it has nothing to do with that. Their brains are just built differently. Their prefrontal cortex, there's a lot of different things going on in their brains that just make it impossible to be able to do the same things that a normal person does. But I think after enough time and enough pain and enough, you know, hardship, I think if you recover the right way and you take the right steps, you can actually turn that around. Like I don't, you there? Yeah, I can hear it, yeah. Oh, okay. You know, like you can actually like, I don't crave drugs or alcohol anymore. Like my addictions have shifted. I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to say I'm, I'm a workout addict. I'm a workout. I work out every single day. It's like I need that endorphin high, but you know what? It works for me. Keeps me in good shape. I'm in, I'm healthy. And when I'm healthy, I can keep spreading the message because when you're out there and you look healthy, people look at that. You right. can't say one thing and look like another. You have to say it and you have to be it. And you know, I think that's all part of it. But, you know, being at more life recovery is a great thing. It keeps me plugged in because it's like these kids look up to me if I let them down if I you know if I let myself down then I let them down right because I you know so it gives me that that extra layer so it's a great thing for everybody involved um as far as my career you know with acting and stuff um I have a film on Amazon Prime right now came out in like May but it's called Made in Mexico you should check it out I play a Mexican it's a pretty cool little part I had a film in the Toronto Film Festival called uh I'm on Fire I have a film that just was in the Yonkers Film Festival. That's the uh, the T-shirt, but it just started the film festival circuit. Personally, I think the film needs to be edited a little bit better. It's got some really awesome stuff. I just think some of the scenes right now are a little too long, and it can be cut a little bit better. But it's really, really good. There's some stuff. It's just like brilliant. It's really, really like original. So I hope uh, you know we get it to the point, and you know everyone can see it. And you know when the point to where we're happy and everyone can see it and enjoy it yeah. and i'm writing something right now i don't want to give too much away and i'd like to start shooting next year but it's called never meet your heroes and and it's it's about addiction not only drug addiction just addiction in one form and how it can manifest in different forms yeah. through genetics and trauma and the accurate way the real way things happen it mm. doesn't just happen addiction doesn't just happen there has to be stuff that preceded it that made it happen you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I want to show that. I want to show some of the psychosis, some of the nuances yeah. of addiction that, you know, your average, well, that's really never been depicted on film, but yeah. that your average person never really saw. And, uh, you know, because it's, it's a part of my life. What I'm writing, a lot of the experiences, uh, most of them are from my own life or from people very close to me. So I kind of all put everything together and weave them into a really cool screenplay. Well, it's actually a story right now. It's being put into a screenplay as we speak, but it's like taking up a lot of my time, but I love it. It's like, that is like a drug for me. Right. That is like, we're coming up. Like I wake up in the middle of the night, come up with a new idea. I literally had uh, index cards laid out on my table with missing blanks. What I did was I had all the index cards and I wrote all the scenes that I know would be in the movie. Right. And then I would put them down I would put them down in order, then I'd have blanks, and then I'd have to fill in blanks, then I would sleep, and then I'd wake up and go fill them. Before I came up with an idea. So it's been an awesome process, still far from done. 
but yeah, you know, things are coming along great. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm healthy. I got my nieces, my nephew. I got a great support system around me because, you know, that's, that's a big reason why I succeeded. Yeah. You know, I, I ask people, you know, that have recovered successfully. What do you think is one of the biggest reasons why you were able to do that? And I'll tell you what, it's the support system you have. Yes. A lot of people have what it takes, but they don't have that support. Right. And it's like hard to go up a ladder. You're almost at the top and then you fall because you don't have that support. You fall all the way to the bottom. Yeah. It's hard to climb up from the bottom again. It's like, damn, I don't want to do this again. Right. But if you're on the last step and you got the support, you don't fall. They catch you. So yeah. All you got to do is maybe go another two steps. So it makes it that much easier. Yeah. But yeah, brother. Well, hey, listen, I mean, what an inspirational story, Lilo, honestly. I mean, just, just sitting there and listening to you. I mean, you can, I can tell in your voice how passionate you really are about what you're putting forth and, the, and what you're doing now with your life. And, and you know, grat token of gratitude to you for that um, and really, you know, change your life around. And honestly, listen, I think it's amazing that, you know, you're almost like, I would say, a saint on earth who's, who's here, like you kind of said, that to help people who may have went through the, what you went through. And now you're able to be that guiding hand and, and, and help these people and guide them in the right direction. And I, and I, I think it's amazing. Honestly, I really want to give you my gratitude for that. And, and, and we just have under six minutes here, about five minutes remaining. So I don't want to cut you off. Uh, but I just want to, we have about five minutes before we go. Um, I just want you to say a couple of things, um, you know, just if word of advice, someone who wants to get involved in something in their career, whether it be acting or sports and just motivational in general, you know, what you well, I would say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You right. never know what's going to happen. See, for me right now, you know, I'm at the treatment center. Right. So it's like acting is not something that I have to do as a necessity for survival anymore. Right. It's, you know, it's more like I can choose the roles that I want to play because, you know, like I did grow up Italian. I come across that way, but I can do much more than that. And, you know, unfortunately like when i go for auditions and stuff a lot of times it's like these are the roles yeah and i don't want to do that i don't want to keep playing you know simple-minded italian characters there's right. no group there and i just won't do it i'd rather not do it at all i'd rather go work in some other industry or some other line of work because that's not what i want to do i want to be able to like recite shakespeare in the rain like i did in renaissance man and stuff like that that, yeah. that can actually give me the opportunity to grow as an actor because like i almost feel guilty like if I'm doing the same old stuff and like posting it and stuff, it's like, but where's the growth? I've been doing right. this for 30 years. Absolutely. You know, it just doesn't do much for me. And it's not really acting. It's like character acting. I want to be able to play like uh, this bottle. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's my advice. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure you have other things going because you never know what's going to happen. You may fall out of love with it one day. You may say, I don't even want to do this one day. Then what do you do? If you had something to fall back on, then that's what you do. But if you don't, then what are you going to do? And especially if you're older, it's so much harder to start over again and to get into something different, you know? Yeah, it's so true. I mean, have have what, have that drive and that idea in life. And, you know, that's something I try to live by, too. I mean, you know, I, I and I not to bring it back on myself for a couple of seconds, but I, I've always dreamed of being able to, you know, have some sort of show or I went to I went to school for this stuff man, and I'm really just trying to push it. That's what I'm passionate about, you know, and, and everyone has their passions in life. Biggest thing is you, you can't be afraid to, 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 to go explore that passion. And at times you're not, you're going to fail. You know, you're going to hit adversity. You know, the kids I coach too in sports, like, you know, I tell them, you know, you, you got to be able to battle adversity. Life's going to throw you curveballs, and how you react to those curveballs or how you're, is how you're going to, what kind of character. Right, right. Yeah. Right. The curveball is 10%. Yep. The way you react to that curveball is 90% of what's going to happen. That's the um, bottom line. Yep. And that's a great, and true. I mean, how, how your reaction and what you take from it is the biggest thing, you know? Right. Cause that's, there's a silver lining in everything. You got to sometimes look a little, you know, search a little more, you know, than other times, but there's always something you can get out of anything, you yeah. know, as difficult as it is sometimes to see it that way. But sometimes that's the only way just to be able to cope and just right. to be able to get through one more day just for today. And then tomorrow is a whole nother day. You know, they say, you know, uh, one day at a time, I yeah. think one day, one day is too long. I say one hour at a time. I like that. You know, one, hour. Yeah. one day, you know how much could happen in one day? I could go relapse, get clean and relapse again in one day. Yeah. You know, that's a lot. Yeah. Time, hour, time is precious. Absolutely. Hour at a time, brother, you know, 
But I want to wish you and yours and everyone else out there that's watching and listening a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you all. And let's make this uh, 2003 the best year yet for everyone. Okay. God bless you all. Thank you, Blake. I appreciate this. And uh, thank you to our friend Joey B for uh, making this happen. So hopefully he sees sees the little shout out. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Hey, um, but you know what? I, I want to thank you again and thank you to my good friend, Joey, like you said, for, for putting this all together, but hopefully, listen, man, I hope we can do this again soon. Um, and my, my honor, my pleasure for having you on the program and hopefully, you know, uh, like I said, we'll set something up soon in the future. And, and Absolutely, that's- brother. And the pleasure is mine. You know what? Um, let's, let's try to do this in a few months because then I'll have a little bit more to talk about as far as the, uh, the film that I'm writing, Absolutely. because right now I want to keep everything on the hush. Yep. But, you know, as time goes on, I'm going to have a little more that I can reveal. I yep. promise you it's something awesome. And it's called Never Meet Your Heroes. Well, we'll All right, brother? Out, we'll, we'll look out for that. Take care. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, my man. Lilo, thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Have a good one. God All bless right, everybody. You. Bye-bye.